In 1985, I was a young photojournalist covering the famine in Ethiopia for Newsweek. I was devastated by the sheer scale of suffering that I saw there. And I'd been a news photographer for some time for Time and Newsweek and other magazines. I'd seen my share of the horror and, and, and death in the world uh, by this point. But this was just like an unsolvable catastrophe. And it felt like there was no solution and no end. When I went back to the Bay Area, went home, I started looking for something more hopeful for the human race that I could photograph. Uh, I was looking for meaning in my own life. That same year, Steve Jobs was fired from Apple Computer. He was forced out in a power play. He was going to start over and start a new company called Next Computer. He announced he was going to build a supercomputer to transform education. That got my attention. I thought, this is the story I'm looking for. Through friends, I reached out to Steve. I told him I wanted to shoot his phone back. I said, I would love to document you and your team building the next computer from birth to shipping. I want to capture your process of innovation, how you do it. And I want to do it for Life magazine. And I want complete access. Amazingly, Steve thought it was a great idea and agreed. He gave me access, and I spent three years documenting Steve and the next team. Because Steve trusted me, everyone did. And I was able to expand my story into Silicon Valley and find cool projects to photograph. I ended up spending 15 years I shot 250,000 negatives. I shot over 70 companies and almost every leading innovator of the day. This work is now being preserved at Stanford Library as a resource for scholars and historians. And that's why tonight I could show you some of these pictures. I'm going to show you several picture stories that I did during the 15 years. And I ended at the end of the dot-com era when the collapse happened in 2000. But I'm going to show you some. And it starts with Steve. I think we all know about his tremendous success. But not everybody understands that he spent 10 years in the wilderness between Apple. When he left Apple and when he went back, he struggled and he failed. And it was a very difficult time. This is, uh, to me, the avatar of a new generation. Steve was like, represented this young group coming in in the 70s and 80s with this humanist sensibility emerging with the space race generation. So now Steve wants to take the power of a mainframe and put it in a one-foot cube in 1985. One day we were looking at the prototype and I turned to Steve who was just standing there casually looking at this square cube that he was going to make and I said, Steve, what are you going to do with this thing? What do you hope to accomplish with this anyway? I was very naive. He turned to me and he said, I want some kid at Stanford to cure cancer in his dorm room. I was electrified. And the thing was, even as a skeptical journalist, I saw that he believed it was possible. You could see in his eyes. I got chills. And because Steve believed it, his team believed it. This is the day Ross Perot came in to give $20 million to Steve, to give him a lifeline. He had started the company with his own money. And Steve thought it would be a great idea to take Ross to this abandoned warehouse and put on a formal lunch. And he told Ross, in this warehouse, we're going to build the world's most advanced robotic assembly line. And we're going to sell 10,000 computers a month. And Ross gave him the money. Steve is saying, hey, everybody, let's work nights and weekends until Christmas, and then we'll take a week off. And this engineer in the back goes, um, Steve, we already are working nights and weekends. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know Susan Care, but you do, because she designed the icons for the Mac. She oversaw the design of the Next. She designed the icons, again, redesigned the Windows icons for Bill Gates and IBM OS 2 and many, many other systems. I actually studied visual anthropology at one point, so I'm, <laughs> I'm collecting data. This is like data points about a new culture that's developing with a new language and new traditions. But this is an actual Steve Jobs to-do list. I like the bottom <laughs> item. Steve the dreamer. He was working at the intersection of the arts and humanities and science. And it was interesting. But you know, I've been blessed in my career. I stood at the North Pole. I crossed the Sahara. I've explored the Amazon. I photographed presidents and movie stars and all kinds of things. But nothing in my 30-year career compares to the electricity of being in Silicon Valley around these innovators. Nothing. Yet, standing near Steve, after all I'd been through, was utterly terrifying. Even though he blessed me and he said, yeah, shoot, whatever, which was unusual, I knew that someday, <laughs> like everyone, he would turn to me and I would have to justify myself. What are you doing here again? 
I had to figure out who I was as a person. You know, I was hiding behind my camera. I was actually immature. But I had to figure out what I believed in and what I was doing. Like most photojournalists, I hope to improve the world or change the world with my pictures. I was willing to die for a photograph. And then I realized, well, here are the people that actually are changing the world. I have a chance to document the people really making these changes. That felt useful. That became my purpose. And once I understood that, Steve was a lot easier for me. <laughs> I call this Steve Jobs pretending to be human. <laughs> 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 it was really about trust with Steve. If you really watched him, he had to know when an engineer presented an idea for a solution, for a technical solution, he had to absolutely believe that person had done their homework and they knew what they were about. Any decision could potentially risk the whole company in a startup. They'd have these meetings and someone would push something across the table and Steve would, if he didn't believe they had done their homework or thought it was right, he would just explode. This is stupid. This is the stupidest fucking idea I've ever seen. But if that person had done their homework and worked day and night for a year and they knew this was the right solution and they were mature and evolved human being, <laughs> they wouldn't take it personally. They would just say, no, Steve, you're wrong. Screw you. You're absolutely wrong. This is perfect. And we'd go back and forth. There'd be this, this intense battle. It might be a minute, five minutes, 20 minutes, and then suddenly, like that, this this switch would flip in Steve's brain and he'd go, great, next victim, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm jumping ahead, 1989 in the spring, they've already announced the computer, but they haven't built a single box. They haven't even got a factory built. He's running out of money and he needs $100 million and everyone in the company is hoping that he's gonna get this money. He's arranged a meeting with Canon, they're interested in investing. Before the meeting, he heard they were gonna lowball him and try and get more equity for less money. Steve comes in wearing a sweater vest, and he's already made everyone upset. This is 1989. And Steve knows culture, and he's very aware that he's now underdressed. And then he begins making six ridiculous demands, like completely unrelated to the agenda. And the Canon guys are getting more and more upset, and he's making more and more demands. And finally, the Canon CEO puts his hand up and says, I need a break, and he goes out the room. Steve turns to his team, and he goes, you guys have fucked up this deal. He slams the table, and he runs out of the room. And we're all like, what happened? I heard later Steve was in the hallway laughing. But anyway, he comes back in. They start the meeting again. And he starts to unwind all those demands. And he gives in. After a long period of time, he's being defeated. Cannon is now crushing the mighty Steve Jobs. One by one, they've, they, all six demands are gone. They're off the table. But interestingly, in that moment, you could just see the power sweep back to Steve across the table. It was an amazing jujitsu. They were going to lose face. They had to throw him a bone. He got the 100 million. He got the robots. He got the optical disc. <laughs> After years of backbreaking work, of pushing his team, they finally launched the product. This is going back to 1988. This is October. This is Washington, D.C. They had this incredible three hour launch in San Francisco and the same thing in Washington. Steve got 80 magazine covers. Uh, everyone was really thrilled except that it was a barely functioning prototype and when they finally did ship months, you know, eight months later, they were late to market and they were way overpriced for their educational community that they were aiming for. But he never gave up on the basic idea and the operating system and that's how he sowed the seeds to his redemption to come back to Apple later. So I'm just going to show you snippets of different stories going forward here. This is Apple without Steve. This is the man who forced Steve out, John Scully, who's a wonderful guy, a really smart guy. And he got a bad rap for pushing Steve out. He also was hit up for being a marketer and not necessarily a technologist. Yet, after Steve left, John Scully grew Apple from $800 million to $8 billion before he himself was forced out. But meanwhile, Apple was looking for some way to rejuvenate itself. On the outside, it looked like a really innovative company in 1992, 93. But inside, they were, they were losing market share, and they couldn't rewrite the operating system. So John Scully found this team, a radical unit inside Apple. Apple. And by the way, innovation in a big, successful company always looks wrong. <laughs> they were a rebel unit, the Newton team. It was a handheld device that you would write on that was a computer. It was ahead of its time. 
And he funded that and they started working. And this is Sarah Clark in the, in the war room of the Newton team. She was a programmer. She had her baby and she didn't leave the building for two years. She would sleep while code was compiling. She'd breastfeed behind a curtain. But Scully put a lot of women in charge of different parts of the Newton team. It was very interesting. And it made me see something in the Valley. You rarely saw women engineers. And I thought about this. Why does diversity matter? Is it social justice? Yes. But it's more than that. It's whoever writes the code, controls the machine, controls your behavior, and changes the culture. <laughs> what if their worldview is different than a 27-year-old guy? Don't jump out of planes when you're writing code. <laughs> Sadly, this was just a monstrous project. They had only 30 engineers writing a million lines of code. And they gave them a year to write the code. And they created this elegant operating system. But then they changed the chip. And they said, you guys have to write it all over again. Koei Sono, who I had photographed for a year working on the code that he was working on for the anchor, he went home, he loaded a pistol, and he shot himself in the heart right before Christmas. And he had just gotten married. <sighs> I just, you know, I think the team was devastated, but all of us were, and I was just a witness. But it made me understand the sacrifice that people were willing to make that's just not understood by people outside the tech community, what it takes to build these products that we take for granted. This is Michael Chow who runs the iPod today, iPad division. He was the product marketing manager and he took the team back together over Christmas. He made everybody work through Christmas and they rallied and they dedicated the machine to Co. And they put a code inside that had his name and they shipped it on time. And it was an emotional catharsis. But in the opposite of next, they shipped too soon. It wasn't ready and it didn't succeed. However, John Scully's vision about this handheld device became the basis of the smartphones. It became the basis of the iPad and the iPhone and the Palm Pilot. So moving to the money, follow the money. Without smart, gutsy investors, you don't get any of this technology. And if you're an entrepreneur, this is the room you want to be doing the elevator pitch. This is John Doerr and Kleiner Perkins. Uh, these guys funded Genentech, Netscape, AOL, Amazon. Part of Google, Twitter, you know, these are these are these are the these are the power people. And they bet big dollars long term. They had faith in these innovators, these crazy people that would come to them. Amazon didn't make a profit for five years. So the thinking back then was very long term. Clinton understood the power of Silicon Valley in ninety five. The US didn't quite know that our economy was driven being driven by Silicon Valley then. These are uh, Mostly Pueblo Indians that are building the Pentium chip at, for Intel. This is Bill Gates saying no one should ever pay more than $50 for a photo. What? <laughs> <laughs> the digital revolution put us all out of work. Um, this is not a strategic map. These are the golf courses that Scott McNeely wants to play <laughs> someday. The last story that I did, it was coming up in the, from 95 to 2000. I went in and out. This is a company called Net Objects. Samir Aurora was the CEO. These guys created software that let you design your own web page. They were the first to do that. This was unleashing the power of the internet early. And it was a typical startup where they have Chinese food at 3 a.m. And I would come in and see, whoa, sometimes I was there at 3. Other source material for these programmers might include pizza, soda, and ho-hos. <laughs> and beer, of course. So it was fun, but then it got ugly because Samir, you know, there's this archetype in Silicon Valley that the visionary founder is forced out. They're not a good manager or whatever it is. These are his investors on the board. There were two employees that were secretly plotting to overthrow Samir. People were disagreeing with his strategies. The investors were telling him that he was fired at this meeting. And the reason is Microsoft was getting in and they didn't like the strategy. Microsoft was now selling their product to compete. Samir refused to go. And they said, we're going to shut you down. We're going to cut off your funds. He refused. He threw them out. They cut off his funds. And he had to stand before 125 employees that had been working around the clock for four years. But he was determined. He went home and he started dialing for dollars. And a few days later, by noon Monday, he had $10 million in the bank. <laughs> he saved the company. Bless you. The even better story is three months later, he sold the company to IBM and the investors that were trying to push him out, he brought them back in. Love you guys. And they made a 1,000% return on their investment. There is a 
less exciting footnote, a year later, IBM took the company public. And at that time, in 99 of March, the dot-com bubble was at its maximum. And Wall Street and everybody was so nervous. And they got a very lukewarm reaction. It was the, CNN came out, I remember watching CNN, and they said, is this the beginning of the end of the dot-com bubble? And it was. Every IPO after that went down and down and down. And by 2000, it was a complete collapse. I don't know how many of you remember 2000, but it, trillions of dollars washed away. It was incredible. And a lot of things changed in tech culture after that. Ironically, as Silicon Valley was crashing, Steve Jobs is rising back like a rocket. He never gave up on that operating system. Despite the failure of the hardware and closing this factory, he had to lay off 300 people. The operating system, the thing that ran the next computer, was 10 years ahead of its time. He sold it to Apple in 1996 for $400 million, and that's how he got back to Apple. And everything today that Apple uses at its core is the next OS that Avi Tevyanian and his team wrote. Everything today at Apple has its roots in that operating system. So, what's coming next? I'm thinking about it, it's scary. But it's also cool. There's three things I wanna mention before I go that I've been thinking about. The future of technology development is the first. The singularity is coming. Computers will gain consciousness. Now, whether you think that is really cool or utterly terrifying, I just think it'd be great to have a dialogue around what's coming next. If anything in the future is possible, how do we choose the best possible future? We didn't get a vote on that atom bomb thing. <laughs> it didn't work out so well. We certainly didn't get a vote on whether we wanted to type with our thumbs on keyboards. What's that? <laughs> We're definitely not going to get a vote on whether we want to upload our brains into a hive mind and live forever. Second, education. There's three million unfilled STEM jobs, give or take, in the US today. So who will be the next Steve Jobs? And where will she come from? <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere, really, because there's a whole batch of hungry tech kids all around the world becoming entrepreneurs and innovators. It's really exciting. But if we don't get our act together here in the US and train more engineers and educate kids to study math and science, she will have a very tough time getting a killer team together. We graduated fewer doctorates of computer science last year than 1970. Third, why is every investment deal today so short term? Since the collapse of the dot com, since 2000, everybody wants their money out in 18 months. Naturally, this has led to innovation around things you can do in 18 months. And what would that be? Apps. Apps are cool. Apps are cool. There's lots of exciting innovation today. There's tons of it. But everything that is productized is an iteration of something that was more or less developed in the 80s and 90s, some things from the 70s. Everything is an iteration. In fact, when you think about innovation, the hard stuff, like I said earlier at the beginning, the really tough problems are not getting funded. They can't get patient money. And I can't think of a single innovation since 2000, when I ended my project, that has scaled up to create millions of full-time jobs, real jobs, here in the US, as happened during the digital revolution. Can you? Well, um, we're at a crossroads. <laughs> we're in a lull. And guess what? The good news? There's an amazing new wave of technology coming, because they come every 25, 30 years. We're in between waves. So this is natural. <laughs> this is natural. And it's exciting what's coming, whether it's genomics, biotech, quantum computing, 3D computers, there's just so much really cool stuff coming and there will be absolutely amazing job creating innovations. And there's a whole new generation of idealistic young innovators looking for the meaning of life coming with it. The people I photographed, they were on a mission. They wanted to invent tools that would improve our lives. They were willing to do anything. And why is it important to have a mission? Because inventing new technology and starting a new company is ridiculously breathtakingly hard. You have to have this insane optimism to walk through that fire. You don't have to be a genius, but you do have to be fearless. Some of you are on your own quest. I've talked to some of you today. If you succeed, you'll change lives. What you do matters. 
if you can find your mission, you will find, if you're willing to sacrifice anything, you will be able to catch that new wave, that next wave that's coming. So please, believe in yourself. Find your passion. Pursue that, the big ideas. Be fearless and catch that new wave to the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.